So let's jump into it. Uh, my name is Nat Burgess. I'm president of the Quorum Group. Quorum Group is a global tech M&A firm founded in 1985. We don't focus exclusively on games, but I'll talk about some of our experience there. And I won't apologize for that either. I think our expertise in all industries really informs what we do in your, in your segment. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I was down in uh, Mountain View yesterday with a company called ANSYS that does embedded systems for airplanes and cars. And at one point, they were telling me about how they compiled the entire cockpit control code for the Airbus A380 onto an iPad and proceeded to fly the plane from an iPad. Not the plane, but a, a simulation. So we're starting to see convergence like that. Um, I represented a company called Caligari that we sold to Microsoft. They were doing 3D web collaboration environments used primarily by engineers and designers. So one person could go in from Slovakia and change a component. And for all the other people in the simulation, it would change for them as well. Industrial application. When we were presenting it to Microsoft, we hosted a, an art gallery. We had a bunch of people create user-generated art we created a gallery, three-dimensional. We hung the art on the walls. We had three-dimensional sound. We had a bunch of Microsoft guys show up virtually and walk through the gallery and talk to each other about the art and their reaction to it with directional sound. So there's an industrial application adapted now into virtual Earth, and it's part of the virtual Earth environment at Microsoft. So we're, we're, we're seeing this convergence. Uh, we're seeing just a tremendous amount of excitement in the space. And when I go into my background briefly, I'll talk about some of the reasons I'm really excited about it. So I've been working in M&A for over 20 years. I was at Morgan Stanley in New York and, and Tokyo in the late 80s. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training. I'm licensed here in Washington. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've been working entirely on, on tech M&A. And it's become a global story. I was on CNBC two weeks ago doing something called the, the Tech M&A Dating Game, complete with music from the old dating game show. We had a lot of fun with that. But before I uh, came to, to Quorum, I actually co-founded an internet company, 1996, that we did uh, basically using screensavers as a gateway to the web. And it was before search really came online, so we struggled to get people to different places on the web. But it was the beginning of something really exciting. And after that, I went to work for Activision and helped put the first generation of multiplayer games on the internet as opposed to on dial-up services like Duango and Catapult. Again, it, it, it's, it was an eye-opener. We could have people joining games over the internet and playing each other in any geography. The latency was good enough. Uh, we, the, the, the game optimization in terms of packet, good enough. And we started to do some upselling and marketing once we had those people connected to us and connected to other people. So just. 96, 97, tremendous amount of excitement. And here we are again in 2011 at the beginning of something, I think, equally big. And you're all playing a leading role in that. And it's, it's the next generation of how people interact over the internet, uh, in the cloud, not necessarily in the cloud flying your A380 with your iPad, but uh, encouraging people to engage socially. And it's, I think, two or three years from now, the landscape's going to look completely different. We're going to be blown away by what we're seeing. We're, go we're, we're going to have over $3 billion in new capital come in through IPOs by the end of this year. And all of that is driving M&A. It's driving consolidation. And running your companies, thinking through strategy, you need to be aware of that. And you need to figure out how to harness it. So I'm on the exciting big picture stuff. I'm going to go right down into the weeds and, and talk to you about how you can build strategy, prepare your company, and execute an M&A event. And if you need another statistic as to why that's important, 99% of companies in this sector will be acquired, some for a lot of money, some for very little. And then the balance will, will probably go out of business. Uh, a couple of reference points in terms of deal background. Uh, we represented Demonware in their sale to Activision, not casual games, but, but hardcore games, basically matchmaking and lobby services for console with a first generation of targeted advertising uh, built in to the, the sort of the social meeting place front-ending the game. Uh, we represented FormGen 
in the sale to uh, GTIS. And one of the principal players in that deal is here today and will actually be on a panel a little bit later. How many of you remember Duke Nukem? You know mess with Lo Wang. When we were working on that deal, we wired up our entire office as, with, as a, basically a weekend LAN party. And our IT guy came in on Monday and he's looking at the logs and he's, what the hell's going on? But yeah, so really excited to have Jim here um, from FormGen. I mentioned the Microsoft deal with Caligari. We also work with Radical Entertainment up in Vancouver. Uh, really smart ex-EA guys. I think they're here. Uh, they were doing hothead games now. Really exciting play in uh, iOS games. And then I put a couple of reference points here that date me a little bit. But when I mentioned putting first generation of multiplayer games on the internet as opposed to dial up, two of the titles we worked on were MechWarrior 3, which I still think is one of the best games ever, and Hyperblade, which is largely, I think, forgotten. But a good game. So that's the reference point. We've done, Quorum Group's done 260 transactions. Uh, I mentioned a couple of the gaming deals, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you some takeaways right up front. So we're, we're talking about building a company that can execute a successful M&A strategy. What do you need to be thinking about? Well, the first is cross-border. Casual Connect, Seattle, Hamburg, Kiev, I believe. It's no accident. The, the market that we're in is global. 60% of the acquisition volume is cross-border. And so you can't be just looking next door. You have to be thinking about uh, other, other countries, other geographies. Most of the deals are strategic, but not in the traditional sense of, of an IP deal. They're strategic for a number of reasons, and we'll go into what those are. Sometimes it can be team building expertise, obviously a blockbuster play, expertise in physics or other elements of gameplay. Quality team, absolutely critical. So this is, this is a development that, that Google has really pushed and has propagated out to Zynga and, and, and others now. Uh, the team interview is almost the most important part of an M&A discussion, and it makes or breaks the deal. Culture. Here's an interesting development. If you read the IPO filings for companies that are going out now, like Zynga and, and Groupon and Facebook, they actually spend a lot of time talking about culture. And, and this is new. People in the finance community are recognizing how hard it is to attract and retain really good talent. And as we all know, the money's important, but it's not the real reason why people stay. They stay because of a culture that gets them excited and projects that get them excited. That actually has financial value. It's an intangible asset of a company. Being able to express that effectively can increase your value. Obviously, product is important. If, you, if you've got a blockbuster title or two out there, uh, or you're being uh, as, as a sort of a supporting vendor, if your technology is being widely used, yeah, that's important. And then relevance to a growing market. Console is important, yes, but what's happening in casual and social and just engaging and, and user communities, I'd say even more so. And then finally, for me, the number one takeaway, you have to run a process. Now, you'll find some people probably even in the room that, is, is Grant Olson here, by the way, from, from Zynga? Grant used to work in M&A over at EMC, went from industrial to, uh, to gaming now. Um, you know, he and I might disagree on this because as an M&A professional, his goal is to zoom in and lock up a great asset and, and, and uh, not have to compete for it. My goal on the sell side is for him to compete for it and to pay a fair price because he knows someone else will pay a bigger price if he doesn't. And uh, running a process, if, if you're approached, the, the single biggest mistake you can make is just to spend six months getting gummed to death by one buyer. You have to get out there and create competition. So what do the statistics tell us about that? Uh, with the process, first offer improves on average by 48%. We did a deal recently. Uh, any, any, anyone from Google in the room? Yeah? Uh, we did a, a deal recently with Google, and uh, the client was instantiations. It was a very competitive bidding situation, and, and Google prevailed. Ultimately, the other guys matched the Google offer, but issues like culture put Google in first place. 75% of the time, there will be a better offer from someone else. That's interesting. You're approached, you're talking in good faith, you get tunnel vision. Take a step back and remind yourself that if you run a process, that first approach will prevail only 25% of the time, statistically. 
And then finally, if you have multiple shareholders, if, you're, if you've raised money, you need to be able to assure them that you're getting the best deal for them. And if, if someone walks in the door and makes an offer and you take it, you'll never know. You haven't calibrated the market. What is a process? Well, a, a process basically is an expression to the market that you'll entertain selling the company at the right price and you're talking to a number of different groups and you're doing it on a set time frame. Now this, for a CEO who hasn't been through this or who's been burned, this is, this is hard to, to get comfortable with because what you don't want is you don't want a for sale sign tacked over your door, right? And you don't want to just feel shopped. Six months later, you don't have a deal and everyone says, oh, those guys have been for sale. And, um, but the fact is, if you, if you pursue this from a position of strength, you know, we've been approached. We have a good relationship with you guys. We want to make sure we, we expose the opportunity to you and talk to you before we do anything that takes us off the market. This is the equivalent of filing an S1 and teeing up a public offering in order to attract an M&A deal. So process, schedule. What you end up doing then is you, you have alignment among the shareholders. Typically, you've been approached. And, and you're basically saying, yeah, it would be interesting to sell to these guys, but we should talk to these other five before we do anything. Now what you need is you need to organize that. You need alignment among the shareholders and the management team. You need to set out a schedule, and you need to prepare yourself with documentation and negotiating alignment to go through that. And we're going to walk through these different steps. But the timeline, typically, you know, even though you're in a process and you're trying to create urgency and force the issue, it's typically still going to run three to nine months to get a deal closed. So the, the deal pop deal here in, in Seattle recently was an exception. That was roughly 45 days, but it takes time. It takes time to go through due diligence, and, and you should prepare yourself and your investors accordingly. You have about a month of preparation to do it right. You have buyer contact, you have negotiations, and then you get into the purchase agreement. You will need to do this properly um, at a minimum so let me pause here for a moment. There's a distinction we make between working in your company and working on your company. If you're focused on the next title, if you're focused on hiring the right person for this spot, if you're focused on closing out the books, those are all important. But those are all working in your company, doing set tasks. Your companies, though, your companies are your product, ultimately, and they're your project. And you need to take the same care in building them and protecting them and protecting their value that you take in your products and in the other elements of your business, okay? Working on your business rather than in your business. If you're doing that, then going through this preparation phase is actually pretty painless. And if you're not, going through this prep phase is a great way to start doing it. You, obviously, you need your taxes to be in order, but having that legacy of data at hand is critical. You need your financial statements, at least three years trailing in the same format. Do recasting. If you've changed from an S-Corp to a C-Corp or vice versa, get it all normalized so that you can compare apples to apples in the period. Three years of projections, that's the hardest part, but standalone projections, not what you could do if Disney bought you, but what you could do on your own. All your bank and accounting records, leases, contracts, explanation of business model and methodologies, Take Zynga, for example. Two years ago, three years ago, they could just go buy a company and figure it out later. They're about to go public now. They've got SOX compliance. They've got jail time in the cards if they're not in control of their business. They're not going to buy a business that exposes them to that risk. So the, 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 the stakes have been raised. Any public company looking at, buy, at buying you is going to be very cognizant of these. Leases, contracts, analysis of competitor market opportunities, and this goes into quality of team, quality of vision. Uh, financial condition and requirements of the company. Supplier lists, agreements, assets. Uh, one thing to think about is IP. Did you have contractors working on things in different geographies? Do you have ironclad work for hire agreements? Do you understand the implications of some of those geographies? Take Slovakia. Uh, they basically changed the rules there a couple of years ago so that developers own what they develop no matter what kind of work for hire agreement you have. And when we were going to sell that company to Microsoft, we had to pay attention to that. The day after you closed, you would have had airplanes of lawyers flying to Slovakia 
telling these developers that they actually had rights in the product that Microsoft is now selling as part of Virtual Earth. And there are ways to work around these things, but you have to be aware of them. So due diligence checklist. If any of you are interested in seeing the complete 30-page list, happy to email it to you. They all look the same. This is your internal homework, uh, being prepared for an M&A deal. So you've got your house in order. You're confident you can survive a due diligence process. You can move through it quickly. You can be very professional. What's next? Now you actually need to be able to present your company compellingly. So who are you going to present it to? Buyer list, contact names, EAs. It's not always obvious who you should be talking to in these companies, especially the ones that are growing quickly. Sometimes you'll find an SVP of marketing who's actually driving M&A strategy. So you need to figure out who that person is. You can waste a lot of time talking with someone who talks about M&A but actually doesn't have any decision-making authority. So be careful. You're going to the right people. You need an analysis for each potential buyer of how you can help them, what, what strategic assets you bring to the table for them. You need to build out introductory letters, and, and sometimes this is an M&A play, sometimes it's more of just a, we'd like to get to know you better to talk about how we can collaborate in certain areas and, and tee up more of a partnership meeting that can escalate. At a certain point, though, you're going to need an executive summary. This is an overview of the opportunity that you bring to the table. And it's not just the dry facts on your financial performance. It includes things like culture and opportunity and, and why you're excited about what you're building. You need an NDA. Uh, it feels like a formality, but if someone buys you, they're going to want assurance that you've paid attention to that with all the other companies that have looked at you first, because chances are they're competitors. Financial memorandum, describing your financial performance and opportunity. Corporate presentation. Now, this is different from an executive summary. This is the presentation that you'll use when you sit down in the boardroom and present your company to the other side. 10 slides, 15 slides, maybe 20, very compelling, very concise. Get the other guys excited about your business. And then as late as possible in this whole M&A process, you want to get to valuation. If you, if, you, if you get to valuation first, the valuation is always too high from their perspective, and uh, you never get anywhere. You, you've got to set the hook. You've got to make it strategic to them, and then get to the valuation discussion. Speaking of valuation, what are they valuing? What are they buying? In some of the later stage deals we work on, it's pretty clearly just the financial performance and the financial opportunity. For a fast growth, exciting, early stage company, it's largely intangibles. It's your vision, captured, manifested in the company. It's the research that you've done on the segment. It's your management team. It's your business model. It's the R&D processes that you've put together, that you're actually shipping product. Documentation, pricing, support, market share, user base. These are all intangibles. These are all things that you have to express effectively. And I, what I see again and again is there's an initial meeting that focuses just on dry facts. And there's mild interest, but not a lot of excitement. And then three or four meetings later, the buyer starts to figure out, wait a minute, there's something more going on here. Oh, you guys are doing this. That's actually really exciting. What I want to see is I want to see you go in there right up front and lead with that and get everyone in the room excited, create that first impression. And if you can do that, the valuation discussion gets a lot easier. So how do we think about buyers then? Is it just a big group of companies that might acquire you? It's, it's actually a little more complicated than that. You've got an A-list. These are the ones you always think about. Obviously, Zynga, Playdom, the very active. We have some new players now coming in. Um, but then you've got a B-list. And these are companies that might be completely unexpected, but they might see tremendous value in what you're doing. So American Greetings, they're generating a lot of revenue from sending e-greetings, which was pretty innovative 10 years ago. They want social engagement. They, they want customers who are going to spend time with them. They're thinking about this sort of thing. There are a lot of companies like that that need an instant offense in your world, and you can bring that to them. So you need to think broadly about it. You don't go out to 100 companies and say we're for sale. What you do is you go to your top 10 very carefully, very strategically, and get discussions going. And then you go to the others with more of a proposition. Have you thought about this market? 
have you thought about what this could mean for you as a business? And the interesting thing is, 25 to 30% of the time, there's a spark there that catches and you end up in a discussion. And sometimes it can, it can, it can turn pretty interesting. So I say that from experience. We've done a lot of deals that came off of the, the B list and, and they started because we were thinking outside of the box and thinking broadly. So just going back to the financial story then, why are companies like your companies so valuable? If we look at it purely from a financial standpoint, what you offer, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, but from a purely financial standpoint, you don't have a lot of barriers between you and your customers. Okay? And you don't have a lot of variable cost that scales as your product gets more popular. And what that can translate into is very high margin businesses once they reach scale. So if I'm talking to a big company that has big distribution and my client has a title that's got small distribution but shows signs that it can go big, that model is pretty easy to build. Uh, above a certain point, it all drops to the bottom line. And that can be pretty exciting from a financial modeling standpoint. So that, that's a financial value. That's an earnings value in the future. You also have a lot of intangibles here that you're trying to express as you negotiate value. And balance sheet doesn't have a lot to do with it. You know, what's your book value? It doesn't really matter. Sometimes you get into a deal with a traditional company. We're actually in the middle of one right now. Manufacturing business buying a, uh, an internet company. And we're having to explain to them why we basically fundamentally change their thinking, focus them on the P&L and on the forecast. So how do you value a company like yours? Well, we hear a lot of talk about sales multiples, and it's convenient because you can often get that data. So you hear so-and-so sold for you know, four times revenue. And sometimes it's relevant. It's a benchmark. Uh, earnings multiple for a more mature company can be relevant, another benchmark. Maybe the most relevant in your space is similar company transactions or comparable deals. If a company that looks a lot like yours was acquired at a high value, think about all the different ways you can benchmark yourself against those metrics. Multiple of headcount, uh, multiple of users, uh, all the different trending in terms of growth that you can do to, to do a sensitivity analysis on that. So our advice there is just pay a lot of attention to the deals that are happening in the space and, and dig around and find as much data as you can because that's an arsenal that can really help you negotiate when you get to the table with a buyer. Discounted cash flow is important as well. This is basically the present value of all your future earnings. You need a good, supportable, defensible forecast in order to drive this, uh, but ultimately you're selling the future. The buyer, they're not going to benefit from what you made last year. They're going to benefit from your contribution to their earnings in three years. And these are pretty speculative spreadsheets, but they're important. The buyer's going to do it, so we're going to do it too, and we're going to inform their thinking on it. And then we get to replacement value. This is always an interesting one. So you have a product or a service, something that you've invested in and built out over time, and you're going to sell it to a buyer. One way to look at it is you've invested $2 million, you know, we'll pay you two and a half. Well, there, there's a crucial aspect to this that we have to remember, and that is that you have it now, right? A buyer could spend $2 million and build the same thing, but they would have it in two or three years. So you have what we call a time to market advantage. You're there now with the product. And a, and a buyer who buys you can also be there now. And I had a really funny conversation years ago with Greg Stanger, who was uh, corp dev at Microsoft, went on to become CFO at Expedia. Uh, we were selling him a company. These guys had spent $9 million building their product. And, uh, and he said, Nat, we'd, we'd been back and forth for a month on valuation, but he finally came back and he said, Nat, you guys spent $9 million on your product. We need it now. And there's a time to market advantage of about 3x for us to have it now. And that was really intriguing to me because I'd always looked at this time to market and tried to figure out different ways to calculate it. So I thought I was going to get a glimpse into how Microsoft did it. And I said, Greg, how did you get to that 3x? 
and he paused, and then he said, well, Nat, we want to pay about $27 million for the company. So. <laughs> but we do end up negotiating replacement value, and, and it is valid. There is an advantage to having something today in a market that's growing so quickly. Just ask Groupon. There are 10,000 daily deal companies out there. Groupon's going to raise a billion dollars in about 10 days. So what's the hard part of valuation? You need good forecasts. And if you don't have a finance background, go find someone who does. Do some stress testing. Build some assumptions. Get their help. Um, you're going to have to understand your profitability going forward. You're going to have to apply some appropriate discount rate to your earnings it's ba based on your cost of capital. Uh, some kind of terminal value to express the value of your earnings through infinity. So that's all hard to pull together, but you can do it with a good forecast and a little help. Uh, you're going to want to look at a relevant peer group. It'll be very interesting to see where Zynga ends up trading, right? Because that's going to be the first pure play game in the sector. Now, they have a tremendous advantage of scale and being an early mover and, and being a, some really smart guys in there. Uh, so it's not like every company in the sector is going to be worth what Zynga is going to be worth. In fact, there will be a lot of significant discounts, but it's still a very useful benchmark. So we'll be watching that closely. You want to find M&A transactions so you can have comparable benchmarks, as we discussed earlier. And then you also want to pay attention to recasting. Let's just take an example. Let's say that you created two titles last year. They cost a million dollars each, and one of them was found to be infringing or for whatever reason you couldn't take it to market. So you take one title to market and it does really well. Well, that million dollars that you invested in the other title, that's a non-recurring expense. It has no residual value. I would argue that you just carve it out and you express the, uh, the, the profitability looking backwards against the investment that actually yielded some return. Now, obviously, you're disclosing the full financials, but you're also creating an argument that says, we're going to take out the non-recurring expense, and we're going to take out the non-recurring uh, revenue. Obviously, I'm covering a ton of ground here pretty quickly, but I'm happy to, to talk about any of this in detail. So market-based valuation, what did the house next door sell for? We're going to be looking at enterprise value to sales, EBITDA, comparable transactions, users, headcount. Replacement value, what would it cost to replace what you have built, fully burdened, including deferred salaries, including all the other costs that may not be expressed as cash. Discounted cash flow, future value of all, or present value of all the future cash flows. And then the intangibles. This is maybe the most important section. You have someone on staff who has a consistent track record of innovation leading to success, leading to earnings. There's a lot of value there. Do you have a track record of building teams in a strategic geography. I hate to keep mentioning Zynga, but they've been really good at identifying companies that can scale in different geographies and using them as a platform to attract talent and to scale. Do you have, are you, did you come up with Angry Birds? Pretty straightforward. Uh, blockbuster franchise. Um, cost of application or acquisition versus replication. And by the way, just as a quick note, our, our view on, there, there's obviously been a, a lot of copying and, and a lot of the M&A discussions out there over the last few years have ended with the buyer saying, you guys want too much money, we're just going to build something similar. We're going to see less and less of that. And we're going to see more and more respect for IP rights and more and more value in IP rights. And I, and I say that partly because it's, it is happening already and some of the judgments and settlements have been substantial, uh, but also because of the people who are now moving in to the M&A roles. And I mentioned Grant Olson from EMC. EMC, one of the most successful acquirers in any sector, very professional, very ethical. Um, we, Google, likewise, I've done three deals with Google. They've been very, very good. They're now populating M&A at, uh, at other, other companies. So anyway, that's just a side note to say you know, what you're building will actually have more value in the future than it might have, ironically, two or three years ago. Core IP that you've built, Demonware, with their matchmaking and lobby services. 
uh, integral part of a lot of the most successful multiplayer games that Activision was launching and a gateway to advertising and, and social interaction. So, and physics. User base, obviously, and, and then channel. So if you've, if you've built out a great following and, and channel on Facebook or some other uh, dimension, that has a lot of value. What are some of the mistakes that can hurt your value? Well, not providing clean financial data, which means backpedaling. You gave them something, you call them a day later and say, whoops, that wasn't quite right, here's what it actually is. You can get away with that once or twice, but you're undermining your credibility every time. You're making them wonder, what else should we know about this? Bad revenue recognition. Revenue recognition is very, very complex, especially when you have any kind of a recurring revenue model. Uh, so that's, you need expert advice on that. Forecasting that just doesn't make sense. Either it's a take it to the bank, highly conservative forecast, or it's a ridiculous, overly aggressive forecast. Irrelevant comps. I have $200,000 in revenue, and I should be valued just like Zynga. Well, it's not quite that simple. Um, apples to oranges, time periods. And then comparing public to private companies without a, an appropriate liquidity discount. Again, if you're going to compare yourself to Zynga, they have advantages you don't have. You need to incorporate that into your analysis. So that all plays into valuation. Now let's talk about structure. This is interesting. In many ways, this is more important than price. Your business is a people-driven business. There's a lot of attention on retaining key talent. That translates into a lot of earnouts and a lot of retention payments over time. And that can be pretty risky, but it can also be pretty rewarding, depending on how that's structured. So if, if, if I came to you with an offer to buy your company and I said, I want to pay $10 million at closing, and then I also will, I'm willing to pay three times your cumulative EBITDA at the end of three years. Or if I came to you and said, I'll pay you $10 million at closing and I'll pay you 20% of your revenue over three years, which deal are you going to take? Anyone? EBITDA being earnings. You're not going to like that earnings ratio, are you? Because the buyer's going to control your earnings. You could argue about that all day long. What kind of corporate overhead burden are they putting on it? They control it. Hence, they control your earnout. And I worked on a deal with a company that I met here, actually, two years ago. Um, and I won't say who it is, because they're in litigation now over exactly this issue. The buyer controlling earnings to control earnout. Percentage of revenue, well, pretty straightforward. We can all pretty well agree on that and what it is. So we want to pay a lot of attention to structure. Are we getting stock or cash? There are a number of companies filing to go public or imminently going public now. Would have been nice to become shareholders a couple of years ago. Pretty extraordinary opportunity. Today, Maybe cash makes more sense. So let's look at this from a buyer's standpoint. I want to buy your company. If I pay cash at the top of the pyramid, that's the most expensive consideration that I can use, right? It's cash. It comes off my balance sheet. I have to sell shares to get the cash or sell product to get the cash. Next up is debt. I'll go to the bank. I'll get some debt. It's encumbered the company, it puts me at risk. There's foreclosure risk, insolvency. It's gonna create debt service, comes off my earnings, but lower risk than cash. Next up, options or shares. There's a cost to both of those, but it's much lower, especially options. Next up is employment agreements. As a buyer, I love that because I'm only gonna pay you if you're still there performing, number one, and number two, it's highly tax advantaged for me to pay you as an employee than to pay you for shares in your company. The problem is it's highly tax disadvantaged for you to receive a salary or an employment bonus as opposed to consideration for shares. You're going to pay 40% instead of 15% on that. And then finally, lowest cost to the buyer earnout. They're going to buy you for your own cash that you're going to generate in the future. And it's really easy for a spreadsheet jockey to come up with a grand scheme and everyone kind of fools themselves into thinking it's all going to work out and it doesn't. So once we get into the realm of earnout, we want to be really careful. But we have had some clients do very, very well uh, from earnouts. 
Let's shift gears now and just talk about the typical flow of a deal. So it typically starts with either a buyer expressing interest in you or you're responding to interest and reaching out to some other potential partners. That first set of discussions is really critical for creating a first impression and also setting expectations on valuation. You want to be prepared. L let me tell you how I think about it. When I walk into a first meeting with a buyer, I always build out a full-blown valuation defense first. So I understand what the comparable deals are, what the market is, what the value drivers are for that buyer. I'm not going to put it on the table, but when I talk to them, it's going to be to create a framework that gets them comfortable in a valuation zone that my client is comfortable in, and, and you should do the same. So you're talking, you're having discussions, then you get into that valuation moment where it's, well, how much do you want? Well, how much are you willing to pay? You go first. No, you go first. Well, I like to go first, unless it's so incredibly competitive and I've got five companies piling on and the auction's going to take it through the roof. Unless that's the case, I want to go first. And I'm going to set the bar high, pretty much as high as I can go without going red in the face. Uh, it's going to be rational, it's going to be well defended, uh, but it's going to be aggressive. And they're going to look at it and they're going to say, oh, we couldn't possibly do that, but I'll talk to my board. And then you have a negotiation. So then you go back and forth and you're trying to get to a point where you have a deal that is worth discussing with your shareholders and your board or that you're willing to compliment, co contemplate. And at that point, you say to the buyer, why don't you put it in writing and we'll talk about it. We'll give it some consideration. Important aspect of this is when they first approach you, if you ask for that offer before you've really expressed your value and started to create a framework for valuation, they will come with a very low offer. Not only that, their CEO will review it, their board will be aware of it, and they will have created an institutional bias towards buying you cheap, which they then have to overcome to get the price up to a reasonable level. So that's why it's so important, these first couple of steps of setting the framework, uh, critical to getting a first LOI that can actually get to where you need it to go. So then typically you go exclusive with a buyer, you sign a no-shop provision that says you won't go talk to anyone else during the 30 or 45 or 60 days it takes them to close, and now you're moving towards closing. What are you negotiating in that letter of intent? Now let's remember, the letter of intent has to be compelling enough to take you off the market. You're not going to go talk to anyone else for a period of time. So it's got to satisfy your needs and your shareholders' needs, and it's not just about price. There are other elements as well. Price is one important thing, but structure, form of consideration. Is it stock? Is it cash? When are they going to pay you? Sources of funds for them. Do they have it on the balance sheet? Is the offer contingent on raising more money? How is risk going to be managed? If they buy you and then something goes terribly wrong two months later, are you on the hook for unlimited liability? I've seen contracts like that. Or is it rational, how the risk is managed? So that, when we, the LOI is, is a topic all to itself. And, and Google in particular has been pretty innovative in structuring LOIs that front load a lot of the tough questions we run into in deals. And, and we encourage all parties in deals to do the same. It's, 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 a, it's a topic that goes too deep for, for an hour today, but it's something I'd be happy to talk with you about one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. How do we qualify the buyer? I can't tell you how many times our clients have been approached by someone who comes in and says, hey, we can, we can pay X. We're really excited about you. And the, and the seller says, that sounds interesting. And then, you know, two, three weeks later, they figure out, oh, the buyer actually has to go raise that money. And now they have to do a round, and it's predicated on the, uh, the deal. And now I've got five sets of due diligence, the buyer plus the LPs in the VC firm that's going to fund the deal. Pain in the ass, seldom get done. Sometimes they do with, a, with, a really, with high quality investors. We just closed one of these recently with Edison Ventures and some others about three months ago, but they're hard. So you want to take a close look at who you're dealing with if it's contingent on financing. Other questions to ask a buyer, because they'll be very open. They're wooing you at this point. Why are you interested in my company? 
Have you done acquisitions before? If so, how'd they work out? Can I talk to some of the CEOs of those companies that you acquired? How have you structured those deals? What's your internal approval process? But when we have the buyers up here later this afternoon, that's one of the questions that, uh, that I'll be asking. What is your approval process? Do, do you have to go to the board to, to get approval just to make an offer on a company? Do they wait for their regularly scheduled board meeting? How cumbersome is it? How agile can you be? Who's involved in making the decision? And what are their biases? Who has to be convinced and sold? How does this company fit with your company? And what's your process for integrating acquisitions? Be blunt, be straightforward with these questions. What these questions tell the buyer is, you're serious about making this deal work if you do the deal, okay? This is not a time to, to play games or be overly polite or diplomatic. This is the time to drill right in. Now let's talk about tactics. Buyers. Buyers want something from you. Maybe it's some intellectual property that you own. Maybe it's some of your key people. Their job is to try to get what they need without buying the company. Buying the company creates risk. It's expensive. Better if they can just license or hire. Uh, I'm actually quoted in the consent decree from Microsoft for their, their uh, antitrust settlement going back about 11 years now, where we had some key engineers, they signed a non-solicitation, and then they went after the wives, okay? It didn't violate the letter of the non-solicit. Uh, think about the lovely house we'll set up for you in Redmond. Uh, another one from that same deal was, uh, does your acquirer really want to make an enemy of Microsoft? Those times have changed, but that, the buyer, if they're doing their job, they're going to try to get what they need without taking the risk of acquiring you. And you're going to have to negotiate through all of those, all of those different proposals. Let's do an exclusive license deal. Let's license this title. Let's make it a minority investment, a strategic investment that basically locks you up. Let's buy just the asset that we care about. So those are buyer tactics. Let's talk about seller tactics. What can the sellers do to maximize their opportunity? Create competition. You can only say no to a buyer so many times before it gets old. It's much more powerful to say, that's not going to work, we have a better offer. Okay? Reveal problems early while the leverage is the highest. You're going to go exclusive with the buyer. You're going to enter a no shop with them. The quid pro quo is you want them to know all of the bad stuff about you before they sign that because you want them to stay on the price that they agreed to. And if you surprise them later with bad news, that's going to affect the valuation. They'll take a haircut. Be very specific and very thorough in the letter of intent. Be creative on structure. Don't dismiss an earnout or retention scheme out of hand because people have made a lot of money on those. Obviously, you have to protect your interest and you have to be careful, but you also need to be creative. And then finally, Close as quickly as possible because nothing good happens between signing exclusivity and closing the deal. So that is what you're trying to accomplish at the point of the letter of intent. Now you sign the letter of intent. What happens next? Well, what doesn't happen is you don't continue talking to the other five or six interested parties. What does happen is you focus entirely on the company that's buying you and you pursue two parallel paths. One is the due diligence process. The other is putting together the final purchase agreement that's going to govern the transaction. So the letter of intent, we've talked about a little bit. It's going to cover the major points of the deal. And it's also going to set up the uh, ground rules that will get you to the definitive agreement. The definitive agreement is the contract that, by operation of law, is going to transfer the ownership of your company. It's going to deliver cash to you and it's going to lock you into a fair amount of risk. So a lot of the negotiation that happens during this period between letter of intent and closing is around allocation of risk. What are some of the biggest mistakes that sellers make in this process? Dealing with only one buyer, because you have almost no leverage in the negotiation. Here, so, so let me just reflect this back onto the earlier discussion about time to market. 
there's a moment in time when your company is very valuable and there are multiple companies that want to acquire it. That's a moment in time when you want to force the issue and see what kind of deal you can accomplish. If you're dealing with only one buyer, everything takes longer, they don't have the urgency, they'll work you over for a period of months. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. Six months, nine months, 12 months. And guess what? That moment in time passes. So not only are you still stuck with the one buyer, but there's less value for your kind of company in the marketplace. That consolidation window can close. And, uh, and then you're really stuck. Then you're stuck with the devil's choice between uh, a bad valuation or going back to, back to work on your company. Second biggest mistake is improper research on potential buyers. So this is really a function of not thinking about different geographies and not thinking about companies that may be outside of your core. Not understanding buyers' process and models. So on, on, uh, it's very typical for a, a CEO of a small company, very agile, can turn on the dime, they can do whatever they want basically, instantly, to be highly frustrated with the pace of a larger company. Now imagine, we, we ran the, the buyers panel last year, we had Zynga, Playdom, uh, Activision, THQ, and then two days after the panel, the Playdom, Playdom was acquired by Disney. They were in the middle of the deal during the panel, they just couldn't talk about it. But even for Playdom at their scale, they were still moving at a breakneck pace. They were very agile. And it was challenging for them to work within the, the schedule and the decision-making constraints and the politics of a, a, a giant like Disney. That's exacerbated tenfold when you're a very small company getting bought by a very large company. So you need to be realistic. You need to understand their process. Bad due diligence preparation. If you talk to people who have been through this process, the guys who will tell you that it was relatively, it's never painless, but relatively painless, are the ones who are truly prepared. Buyer shows up with a due diligence checklist. Two days later, they open up an FTP or they open up a data, electronic data room and all the information is there. I can't tell you how far that goes in establishing how professional you're prepared to be with buyers. Not qualifying the buyer properly. We have, uh, like I said, I was in um, Mountain View yesterday. I was in Portland the day before working with a client in, based in Paris. So we went to see a company a month ago and we met with some corporate development folks and we had a great conversation and they talked about valuation and, and it, from my client's perspective, it felt like a good meeting that was gonna lead to a bona fide offer. What I knew was that the guys we were talking to actually have no clout in the organization. They're just kind of, they're floating around, uh, staying busy. But no one's really taking them that seriously. And so what we had to do is engineer a next meeting at the next level of management, which we did two days ago. And we had decision makers in the room and it was a different conversation. Much more conservative on valuation, much more skeptical. And my client walked out and said, it's over. We had a good meeting a month ago. We had a terrible meeting today. And my response was, no, this is, this is actually the beginning because now we're dealing with the decision makers. And then finally, maybe the hardest part, not orchestrating all the buyers properly. It's, sometimes it's impossible. Sometimes someone comes in and wants to be preemptive. They want to they take you off the market. You're still holding that, that uh, threat implied threat of, of a full-blown process over their head, but sometimes the offer and terms are good enough where you say, yeah, okay, we'll do it. Uh, sometimes you have a company that can move quickly and a company that moves slowly, and you think the company that moves slowly might ultimately make a better offer, but you just have no choice because of the, just the wear and tear of the process to go with the, the first mover. That happens. Uh, so you're doing everything you can to keep everyone in sync, and when you can't, you do the best you can with the situation. So I'm going to um, close just on a couple of thoughts on the benefits of global search. Again, I think this is really important. If you're approached or you're thinking about doing a deal, if you think you have some unique quality that's going to have tremendous value to a specific buyer, I want you to think broadly about who else it's valuable to. And think about how you orchestrate a process where it's exposed to all the most likely buyers. They have a chance to react. 
they have a chance to step up and do something or decline, and you get market calibration, you get the best possible offer in terms, and maybe most importantly, you lower your execution risk. Your odds of getting a deal closed go up pretty dramatically. Rushing into an LOI with inadequate disclosures on both sides, that's going to fail nine times out of 10. Buyer will get surprised, they'll walk away. Process gives you a chance to inform everyone of everything and, uh, and make sure it's a deal that will stick. So I'm going to finish here. Uh, I, Invite, I, I was wrong about lunch, this is great, we have, we have lunch. So if you're staying for the next session, help yourself, have a seat. Um, if not, help yourself and, and head out. Meanwhile, I'm happy to address any questions while lunch gets sorted. Yeah? Uh, what's your uh, take on breakup fees while you're in the uh, LOI process? So often you have, it's obviously the interest of the buyer to get you into an LOI, it takes you off the market. However, then once you're in that process, they will slow it down, Yeah, that's a great question, and, and it's a logical response to that dynamic where the buyer wears you down, lowers the price, takes haircuts, changes the terms. Um, the fact is, it almost, you almost never see breakup fees in the small deals. So we, we do on occasion, typically when there's a contingency, like you have to hit a milestone, you have to get a title done, you have to do something before it closes, but almost never do you see breakup fees. So what you think about is, what else can I do to minimize the threat that the buyer poses in that period? First is shorten the time of exclusivity as much as possible. Second is give yourself an early exit. If they stop making progress on the definitive purchase agreement, give yourself a window to walk out uh, to end the exclusivity. The third is full disclosure. When, when someone tells me about how the buyer wore them down, stretched out the timeline, and reduced the price, and I dig in, usually there were seller disclosures that happened late that surprised the buyer. So it feels unfair to the seller, but they could have actually managed through it with better disclosure. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, Tim Merrill, DigiCapital. We're a games investment bank. Um, we believe that the bulk of consolidation in the long term will come from the strongest Chinese, Japanese, and South Korean games companies um, who we work with. And in particular, what they're looking for are probably two things, either fantastic business platforms they can use as a way to go out as a way to globalize. And secondly, great IP that can cross cultures and can be brought back into domestic markets and run but at a far higher profit than you can run in Western markets. Where do you see consolidation in the games market coming from? Yeah, great question. So the question is really about um, China, Japan, Korea driving consolidation going forward. Um, we also believe that will happen. The total percentage of cross-border M&A driven by Asian acquirers last year was 1.5% globally. So it's not happening yet. And um, what we're seeing, and, and we've seen a little bit from Japan, so I helped Duango, uh, for example, invest in two companies here. Um, but it will happen. And, and it's partly a function of capital and strong markets. And it's partly exactly what you mentioned in terms of bringing new IPs to, to other geographies. But my view is, if, if you're on a two or three year time frame, think about that and, and build strategy towards it. If you're on a six month time frame, less likely that that's where you'll see your, your transaction coming from. Other questions? Yeah. I've been involved in a couple, uh, in a, more than a few acquisitions, either being an acquiring organization or doing acquiring. Um, two out of five, succeed, right? That's what all the stats say. One of them really succeeds. The rest of the four are either failures or not. One guy I worked with once said, rule number one about an acquisition is the company culture that's acquiring always sucks. Rule number two is it always wins out. Um, in the game space, we're talking about creative industries. The advertising industry's done actually a great job of a leave them alone thing. And I'm always amazed in the due diligence. They worry about the key man thing and the IP and the assets and blah, blah, blah. They don't worry about that middle tier of the organization, which is, in fact, where the assets, the brains are. And they, of course, do walk out the door after whatever the period is for the earnout and so forth. 
So I'm always stunned that no one's really looking at this stuff. Like when, once the deal's over, um, and there are obviously yeah. all sorts of interests. What, what are the, what's the thinking on that? You brought up culture, and I'm frankly surprised to hear that there's. Yeah, that's in that. a great. It's a great question. The question is, why do buyers, with only two out of five deals succeeding, and a lot of failure in middle management keeping their attention, keeping them excited, why do people keep making the same mistakes? Two two thoughts there. One is. There's actually a white paper that I wrote with uh, EMC on our website, quorumgroup.com, about the hallmarks of successful acquisitions. And I'd encourage you to read it because buy some certain buyers consistently make successful acquisitions. And they do the same things again and again. They consistently invest at least 25% of the acquisition cost on top of the acquisition in integration, marketing programs, making it work. They invest in it. They don't just expect it to pan out. And, and then the second thing is, the, um, what you'll see is, your point is very well taken. You see management carve-outs that reward one person. Well, what about everyone else? Well, that investment in the company buoys everyone else. And then we also see, for example, with Google, much broader-based incentives. I, I worked on a deal recently with 24 employees going to Google. Every one of them shared in the management bonus pool. What that means from a deal perspective is you throw the cap table out the window which investors hate because they invested in that cap table and they want their share of the proceeds. But that's frankly, with these small emerging successful companies, that's the right way to do it. It's actually time for our next, yep. okay, one more quick one. Uh, uh, quick, I was just curious, this is a process question. In the, uh, have you ever seen as a tactic from a buyer um, closing out of the negotiation, closing the no shop as a way of sweating it out and then coming back later with a different, uh, different sort of basically as an alternative to bidding down during the final negotiations? In other words, the buyer enters into a nose shop and then before they close, yeah, they, so it's post they LOI, freeze the deal. LOI is agreed, due diligence, late due diligence, um, and then just kind of, you know, mysteriously vanishes, you know, the deal just kind of myst mysteriously vanishes. They close out of the no shop look interested elsewhere. Have you ever seen that actually as a tactic? But the, the implication there is the seller could, could go sell to someone else. Yeah, that's true. So yeah. when, I'm, when I'm managing a process, it's, it's mutually assured self-destruction, right? Okay. So first yeah. of all, I'm trying to build in an exit to the no shop where if the buyer stops making progress mm -hmm. in good faith, I have an exit. Yeah. Second is, if, if the no shop's gonna expire without a deal, I'm gonna suggest to the buyer that they negotiate with me for an extension and if mm -hmm. they decline, Mm -hmm. I'm out shopping the deal the next day. Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to have patience for that game. And I think as a seller, that's how you have to play it. Yeah, you can't, sense. Because typically what you're dealing with there is not malicious. It's just lack of corporate will and, and coordination. So you have to force the issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, let's bring up our panel.